Hey, Professor Spooner, how are you today? Good morning, Frank. I'm well, thank you, and I hope you are too, and thank enjoying you. the news, or at least that, that it's keeping you uh, interested. Entertain. In entertain. Uh, I must admit that I get more and uh, more, um, uh, what should I say, um, uh, I'm not sure what the right word is, but the, 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 the way things are reported um, doesn't please me. Um, the, 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 the news media never give you the, the information that you really need in order to understand why things, why the things that they're reporting are actually happening. And uh, the biggest problem uh, uh, of this type is in the Middle East. Uh -huh. uh, but I'm not sure we're going to get to that today. The, uh, the, the, the main thing I wanted to talk about today is the fact that uh, uh, there are so many problems in the world and the number of problems seems to get uh, larger every week. And we've talked before about this being the crucial phase of globalization. Um, in that uh, we're on a, we're at a stage of the process of globalization, whenever you th might think it actually started, when we can um, imagine it coming to a close mm -hmm. uh, at some point, uh, possibly within the next hundred years. Um, but uh, the problem is that um, it's requiring all sorts of um, uh, new um, ways of organizing interaction and it's the interaction uh, uh, interaction is the is the is the uh, basic process the the changes in the way we interact and the numbers of people who are interacting with each other and um, the the institutional forms that we've had up until now for interaction simply aren't working anymore because they're not large enough um, and it seemed to me this past week, looking at Brexit, um, which uh, takes a lot of my attention, I'm afraid, simply because uh, uh, it affects the place I came from, uh, but also what's going on in, um, in the politics in this country and uh, in a number of other parts of the world, including places like Indonesia. Um, the, um, uh, nothing is working in the way that we were confident things would always work up until um, uh, 50 years ago at any rate. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, the world that I got used to in the middle of the last century um, is still basically the same shape as it was before, uh, but it, it, it used to work then and now it doesn't work. And um, uh, we've talked about a number of these things before, uh, but we haven't really um, uh, got to the point where we can uh, explain them, I don't think. Uh, and I, it seems to me that perhaps it is possible to understand better why things are happening the way they are now. Uh, and it, it, we've talked about the problem of organization, uh, and we've talked about the importance of um, uh, its interaction in everything that happens. But we haven't noticed, I think, that it's the, the, the groups that are still small arenas of interaction are working perfectly well. And all the problems, uh, at least all the ones I've been able to think of, of so far this morning, are situations in which there are much larger numbers of people interacting with each other uh, than there were before. So, for example, the uh, the uh, presidential election of the United States in, in 2016. Um, I'm not sure what the voting numbers were, but uh, and, and, uh, all sorts of people were paying much more attention to who they should vote for than used to be the case in the past, I think. And uh, they come up with somebody who has no experience in government. Um, the uh, European Union is, um, not, apart from Brexit, um, running into other problems, which all have to do with uh, uh, how uh, uh, close to 400 million people can organize themselves in, uh, compared to the way things were being organized until a short time ago. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think you can point to changes like this almost everywhere else. Um, so uh, th this makes one wonder 
as uh, globalization continues uh, in the next uh, in the coming decades whether it's it's going to be small groups of people who still which which still work very well that finish up uh, controlling large areas of the world simply because none of the situations in which larger and larger numbers of people are interacting uh, according to the institutional forms that we have so far uh, are, are managing to work properly. Well, I think that's an interesting uh, observation. And I, I would go back to what you said at the onset when you, you made a remark about the uh, newspapers and media reporting what's going on, but not why it's going on. Um, and then you observe that small uh, groups, small social groups, if you will, are in fact working much more cohesively than larger groups. And I think part of the reason is, is that what, what's happened now is that these larger groups uh, don't have uh, the foundational understanding and background and knowledge of specific issues or indeed of any issues um, and are thus easily swayed by uh, the arguments of the day or any sort of populist rhetoric. Whereas the smaller cohesive groups seemingly uh, uh, relay that foundation knowledge uh, regularly and make sure that uh, members of that group understand and are reinforced and know uh, the, the quote unquote facts as, as that group might present them, uh, which gives them a tremendous amount of uh, leverage and advantage over the larger groups that can be blown by the wind of argument at any given time. Let me ask one other question before I turn it back to you. You also mentioned that this crucial phase of globalization you think is going to end in about 100 years. What did you mean by that? I meant that uh, the, um, uh, that's the best way to say it, the, 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 the crucial phase is a, is a period um, towards the end of the process in which there is um, uh, uh, more resistance to what's going on than there is um, uh, enthusiasm for what's going on. And um, uh, I think that um, we're getting so close to a situation in which it's easy for everybody anywhere in the world to interact with each other. Mm -hmm. And the, the nation state uh, arena of interaction is um, uh, not the mo not such an important part of uh, anybody's position in the world as it used to be, that um, we're going to find ourselves in a situation in which um, uh, the nation states are not the determining forces in the world, okay. and we don't yet know what the determining forces are going to be. Okay. Uh, this um, uh, actually may be a, a good um, time to, to um, bring the Middle East into the argument, because in some ways it's an interesting case that may throw light on what's going on in other places. Um, the, the, um, I think if you asked a number of specialists now about what the problems in the Middle East are, you get very different answers from what I'm going to suggest. Uh, uh, and this isn't just a suggestion, this is something I've been thinking about for a long time, uh, is that um, uh, all the problems in the Middle East today are, uh, were, are caused by what happened 1,500 years ago, when um, I'm told that I'm muted. Can you hear me? You're, you're not muted. I'm muted because our dogs were barking. Oh, okay. Oh, all right. <laughs> um, the um, uh, as as um, Islam grew and spread, it broke into two, Shia and Sunni. And the reason it broke into two was that there were two types of community uh, in what was becoming the Islamic world that had completely different ideas about authority and how to accept authority. And authority has been a problem in Islam 
uh, ever since, because uh, unlike Christianity, which has a pope, which of course caused other problems later on, mm-hmm. um, the um, uh, Islam has this um, same um, way, institutional forms of um, determining what's correct and what's not correct as Judaism does. That is, it's an assembly of scholars. Mm-hmm. Um, so the, the, the um, conflict over what, how authority should be um, uh, institutionalized um, began in the middle of the seventh century between what is now Iran, uh, which was the um, uh, um, latest of the series of empires, each bigger than the one before in the Middle East, and um, the rest, and Arabia, or at least uh, the the other parts of the Middle East that hadn't been part of the empire, where Islam had in fact begun, which were tribal, and had completely different ideas about how authority should be determined. And uh, that uh, has been made much more complicated or much more complex in the last century, simply because of oil and the way other parts of the world have got involved in what's going on in the Middle East, and especially in the way that the US has uh, supported um, since the 1950s, um, the Sunni version of Islam, because it's the center of the, um, uh, their interest in the oil in the Middle East and Arabia. Uh, so now, um, uh, the, uh, the, the way that everything in the Middle East is, is um, reported, uh, everything that is against Saudi Arabia is wrong and is uh, rebels and terrorists. And everything that Saudi Arabia does, which includes bombing Yemen, is something we should help them do. Um, you, you, do you believe that, I mean, that's if you were to ask the Congress that they might agree with you, but I don't think that's any longer the way it's reported in the media. No, no. I, mean, I don't think people in Congress understand that either. Nobody no. knows anything about the differences between Shia and Sunni. Mm-hmm. And 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 uh, and those who who um, in policy, um, and I've 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 spoken to people in the in the State Department about this, have absolutely no idea about these things, mm-hmm. and think that everything that Iran is is responsible for is supporting rebels. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, um, I mean, this is not this is a problem not only of journalism. Um, uh, but also of foreign policy and, and other levels of decision making. But um, the thing is that the people in in um, in the news media don't do any research to try to find out why things are happening. Uh, they simply uh, report what they see and report it in terms of the way they think that it's understood already. Well, then, so uh, how, how does, let me ask you a question then. I'm not dis- necessarily disagreeing with you, but how is it that I, who am probably an average reader of events, uh, has uh, have a perception that Mohammed bin uh, Sultan, MBS, uh, is in fact a bad actor, uh, that Saudi Arabia is persecuting a, 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 a minority group in Yemen, uh, for their own reasons, and that the Saudis are willing to do anything in order to maintain their leverage and relationship with the United States uh, for fear of uh, some sort of rapprochement between Tehran and Washington. Um, I mean, I I know this, and I, I seem to be able to read corroborating evidence of this in the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. Uh, it, it, it's almost as if it's a, a kind of wink, wink kind of journalism saying, all right, well, here's what the Saudis are saying. Now they, they claim they didn't kill Adnan Khashoggi, but we all know that they did. Uh, they claim that they're not persecuting a war in Yemen when we all know that they are, uh, they claim that they didn't uh, behead and crucify 47 people last weekend when we know that they did and going right down the list. I mean, I, I think it's understood. 
um, whatever the colloquial term of being understood is, but I think it's understood by by people who follow events that the, the Saudis are uh, in a little bit over their heads right now. It, it's, it's it's such an irony because uh, Iran is 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 a, has a democratically elected government, and the Saudi Arabia won't have anything to do with democracy. Correct. Um, and uh, so America, who which in the past has always been um, uh, tried to be known for spreading democracy, oh, yeah. uh, often yeah. very unsuccessfully, um, is supporting the most uh, undemocratic country in the region. The, the, there's no question that that's exactly true, and it's there's no question that that's simply true because of of, of the oil. And it's also no question that right now, and you know this as well as I do, the United States exports more oil per day than does Saudi Arabia. <laughs> so, uh, so there's no, it's not surprising that the world's in a mess. <laughs> yes, yeah. I mean, the, the, and, and it goes back to what we started with: is this is a hangover policy? It's a hangover uh. policy that began when Franklin Roosevelt met. Uh, MBS's great grandfather on the warship in the Red Sea, uh, coming yeah. back from Yalta, and sort of sealed the deal. And even though uh, economically right now we're exporting more oil than are the Saudis, and we don't need their oil, we're still doing what we're doing with them. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I guess on that so note, the, we should go ahead. The, the question is simply how are we how. Uh, are our ways of organizing people uh, for what has to be done going to change in the rest of this century? Uh, or are things just going to get messier and messier, or are we going to become better organizers? Well, that we better get organized pretty darn quickly because things are getting messy fast. So. <laughs> All right, well, okay. Professor Spooner, thank you very much. We'll look forward to talking next week. Yes. All right.